from Commando.com. This is, of course, the Commando on Demand podcast. We actually release two new episodes every week, and we talk to the industry movers and shakers, and we keep you up to date on everything digital. And today, it's a really special episode. If you have kids in your family, you definitely don't want to miss this episode. We're going to tell you exactly how kids are getting seduced and enticed and recruited online. It's really frightening, but you need to know what's going on. But first, before we get to all this, let's take a moment and thank our partners in this podcast because they help make it possible. It just seems to be happening everywhere. 17 Colorado children have been rescued from sex traffickers. The youngest was three months old. And the stories, well, they're always heartbreaking. I walked into the motel room. I see a man sitting in the corner. The first thing that came out of his mouth was, take off your clothes so we can take these pictures. Technology is at the forefront of these predators' tactics to lure in our children. Kids are probably on one right now, an iPad, even a smartphone. But these devices are also being used as traps by predators for things like human trafficking. In February of 2017, actor Ashton Kutcher spoke to Congress about the sex trafficking of children. Our first witness today is Mr. Ashton Kutcher. As part of my anti-trafficking work, I've met victims in Russia, in India, victims in New York and New Jersey and all across our country. I've seen video content of a child that's the same age as mine being raped by an American man that was a sex tourist in Cambodia. And this child was so conditioned by her environment that she thought she was engaging in play. Internet-based child recruitment and abduction. It actually comes in all shapes and sizes. These online predators are clever. They're savvy. They're after our kids. And they get to the kids in all sorts of ways, especially using technology. It gets easier for them, as you might imagine. From there, some kids get sold into sex trafficking. Some get recruited into terrorist groups. And some kids are actually held for ransom. Now, some kidnappings, well, they're not exactly real, believe it or not. These are called virtual kidnapping, and it's definitely on the rise. The point is, you need to be aware of all vulnerabilities because child predators and virtual kidnappers, they're just going to keep changing their strategy. You wouldn't leave your kid in the bad part of town on a Saturday night at 11.30 p.m. So why would you leave your door unlocked on your child's phones, their gadgets, all their devices? It's the same thing, folks. And in this Command On Demand podcast, we put together a great roundup of folks who are going to share some pretty disturbing real life stories. I got to tell you right here at the top, we're talking to former predators, victims and hate group recruiters. Plus, we're going to chat with a sex trafficking educational expert. Her name is Stacy Sutherland. She's from Trust, Arizona. And we're going to talk about how to protect your kids and where to go for help. And by the end of this podcast, you're going to know exactly how child recruitment and virtual kidnapping happens and really what to do about it and how to prevent it. All in this week's Commando on Demand. Oh, look, honey, it's Madison calling. I'll get it. It's every parent's nightmare. The phone call every parent dreads. And this phone call happened to Olympic gold medalist Rowdy Gaines and his wife, Judy. So it popped up her face and her number. He started shouting expletives and that he was going to shoot our daughter. We could hear a woman screaming and him yelling to them to stop beating her. Madison, is that you? Hey, put my daughter on the phone right now. Eventually, they put our daughter on the phone and said, Dad, and I said, Madison, are you okay? And she said, yes, but I need help. And then, boom, they cut her off again. Olympic gold medalist Rowdy Gaines' story is true, but it doesn't really end like you think it does. I'm going to tell you what happens in a sec. Call 911. Call 911. We've got our daughter. Judy begged Rowdy to call the police. What would you do? Rowdy Gaines had no idea, well, that the whole thing was actually a scam, Would you believe the crooks had Madison, their daughter, on the other line, and she was being scammed as well. They told her a completely different story about her parents. And I heard my dad yell out, Madison, Madison, let me talk to my daughter. And I questioned, Madison, are you okay? She said, I'm okay, but I need help. Rowdy stayed on the line, and he tried to negotiate with the caller. 
Okay, okay, what, what do I have to do? I want you to go to the store and buy some gift cards. Gift cards? You heard me. Just do it. Wait a minute. Gift cards? Well, that's when Rowdy started to suspect that something was wrong, something was up. And it turned out his gut feeling was right. Madison and her family were both being scammed of what's called a virtual kidnapping. You see, Madison's number was spoofed, meaning that her cell phone number had been hijacked so that when somebody else called using a different phone, that phone number actually showed up. So when the virtual kidnapper called Madison's parents, they looked down and they saw Madison's phone number and they thought, heck, it must be Madison. Madison called the scammers, and that's how Rowdy was able to hear his daughter. Now, depending on the scam, sometimes the voice on the other end isn't your loved one at all, but it could just be an actor. It was pretty confusing, as you might imagine. You see, Madison was being told a completely different story. The Gaines told both NBC and WESH TV that they were able to end the scam once they realized that their daughter was safe. I mean, she was okay. Madison fell for it, though. And she sent the crooks around $700. You were grateful that our daughter was safe. And that's all that really mattered. That's all that really mattered to us. Virtual kidnapping is nothing new, but it's definitely on the rise. You see, kidnappers have figured out how to spoof numbers and set up conference calls without ever being detected. If your daughter happens to be out of town and hackers can spoof her number, they might be able to convince you in a number of ways that she's in danger or being held hostage. Now, if this happens to you, don't mention your daughter's name. Don't say it. If you tell the callers your daughter's name, they have you. Most of them have no idea who it is they're supposedly kidnapping. It's all done by numbers. To cover up for this loophole, callers will often be threatening. They'll be violent. They'll be extremely loud. That's why the FBI recommends that you just hang up on aggressive callers. Make sure the geotagging on you and your child's phone is off and set to private. And again, never say your child's name to a caller ever. And try to reach the person who they allegedly kidnapped immediately. It could be real. You'll find out soon enough. What you don't want to do is to give these scammers an extra edge by playing their game. That's why it's always a good idea with all the kids in your family to have like a secret code word. So if they're really in danger, they say that secret code word. And if somebody tells them that their parents are in danger, well, that person also has to be told the secret code word. It's kind of like a checks and balances. That secret code word trick was actually credited for saving possibly a little girl's life. You see, the girl's mother, Brenda James, she was at work and her daughter called her in tears, just so upset. She told her that some guy tried to take her. The 10-year-old little girl was walking with her friend when a man in a white SUV allegedly pulled up to them and told the little girl that, hey, hey, you need to get in my car, your brother's hurt. Well, the little girl asked the guy for the secret code word. And when he didn't know it, he took off. Teaching a child a secret code word could potentially save his or her life. Coming up, you're going to meet an award-winning filmmaker and actress who's passionate about teaching girls how to spot sex traffickers online. And you also have to know that sex traffickers aren't the only ones recruiting kids. We're going to also talk about the latest grooming tactics. Oh my gosh, this stuff is so scary that the hate and the terrorist groups are using. After we hear from the good folks who help make this podcast possible, I'm talking about Quip a brand new type of toothbrush you have to know about. All right, I know you've had parents and teachers and dentists telling you how to brush your teeth your whole life, and it seems like everybody has a different technique. One thing that they all can agree on is that you have to brush your teeth for a full two minutes. I've been telling my son Ian that for years. Ah, but not anymore. I have a Quip, and so does Ian. Quip is electric. It's small, it's light, it's sleek. There's a built-in two-minute timer that pulses every 30 seconds to remind you, are you ready for it? Yes, switch sides. You don't have to guess anymore. With Quip, new brush heads are automatically delivered, just like the dentist recommend every three months for just $5, so you can just forget about it. Try Quip and see why it's backed by more than 20,000 dental professionals and me and my son Ian. We both love our Quip. Quip starts at just $25. That's it. Visit getquip.com slash tech right now, and you're going to get a deal. You get your first refill pack for free with any Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free. Yes, absolutely free. Head over to getquip.com slash tech. 
That's G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash tech. I was a naive 15-year-old. I didn't know the streets, so I didn't know the bad things that came with it. I just thought that it'd be fun, you know, maybe party, maybe drink. But I never would have been prepared for what really happened. I would describe Alyssa when I first met her as afraid, as cautious. Her experiences were some of the most violent, the most traumatic that I've seen. My everyday life was laying there, naked, beaten, and allowing guys to come and pay $10, $20 to do whatever they wanted to me. She was being forced to do it. We're talking about buying and selling children for sex acts. How many men? 50 over the course of two weeks. It never crossed my mind in my wildest dreams that my child was involved in human trafficking. So Madison is safe, but what about the other children that go missing? Now, a lot of those kids, I know what you're thinking, well, they ran away. They left because they wanted. Maybe they were convinced by a kind-hearted stranger that they're going to have more freedom, more toys, more bling, more acceptance. Maybe they can party more than they can at home. I just thought that it'd be fun, you know, maybe party, maybe drink. Maybe they're going to get more love than they ever got at home. These traffickers made me feel like I was loved. You know, I was running from something, and I was running to love and acceptance. This resonates with every child, whether they get A's or F's. Maybe they're rich or poor. It doesn't matter. Kids fall for it, and they fall for it all the time. It could happen to your daughters. It could happen to any daughter. It is not just somebody who is impoverished. Um, Social media plays a huge role in this. The traffickers are very smart, and they'll look at your posts. And so if you're saying you're depressed, if you're saying, I just want somebody to pay attention to me, they'll find that, they'll lock onto that. That's Alyssa Ivinson of WANE TV in Fort Wayne, Indiana. She put together an underground investigative series on sex trafficking. It turns out that anyone, and I do mean anyone, could be trying to recruit your child. It could be a friend, a teacher, a boyfriend, a next-door neighbor. They could methodically and patiently be grooming your son or your daughter, your grandson or your granddaughter, into the slave trade. Meet Alyssa. But I met this girl, and this girl, she was just powerful. You know, she had a voice, and I just wanted to be like her. So when she asked me if I wanted to run away from the rehab with her, I automatically said yes. Um, But not knowing that she was already caught into the sex trade, you know, I just remember him being really nice, and, you know, he was kind, um, and I thought he was a good guy. I was introduced to really hard drugs by him. He started, you know, transporting me to different locations where um, I was trafficked. And then finally, you know, when I was like, you know what, I'm not comfortable with this. I don't want to do this anymore. He started holding me hostage in hotel rooms. It happens at the town center. It happens on Bay Meadows. It happens on Phillips Highway. But it's not just Phillips Highway. It's everywhere and anywhere. I remember saying to myself, you know, I I just, I want to die. You know, I can't do this anymore. You know, I felt so much shame. um, And I blamed myself, as a lot of women and girls and boys do. According to TrustAZ.org, the average age of a human or sex trafficking recruit, boy, it's so young, it's 14 years old, but some of them, and this is just disgusting, are as young as two or three years old. They're probably still in school. In fact, their parents won't even know that their child is involved in the sex trade. They tell their parents that they have a part-time job. Maybe they're cleaning offices at night or something like that. They'll start buying nice things for themselves, like expensive designer clothes, or maybe the latest tech gadgets. Well, they better enjoy these toys while they can, because the average life expectancy of a child who's being trafficked is just seven years. Wow. Seven years. And the parents, most of them hardworking, intelligent, afraid to monitor their children's internet use because maybe they don't want to invade their privacy. Well, let me tell you, if you don't invade their privacy, someone else definitely will. 
There was about four or five other girls living in the in the house with us, and she had told me, she's like, this is my boyfriend Joker, and he's going to take good care of you. Joker was very nice to me. He would take me out, and we'd go to the movies, and he'd buy me clothes, and he'd get my nails done. And it was one day, you know, Joker came up to me and asked me, I'm sitting on the couch. He's like, we're going to go out for a little bit. Do you want to come out with us? I was like, sure. We pull up to this motel. It's me and this other girl. We go into this motel. She meets up with this man, and she's talking to this guy, and they're exchanging some words, and they're talking about sexual things, and I'm starting to catch on, and things are starting to click in my head. Jaden was forced to witness her underage friends perform sex act after sex act as a quote-unquote payment for taking refuge in a pimp's house. After everything's finished and he pays her, Joker sits down and tells me, I'm not asking you to do what they do, but I'm asking you to sit in on every appointment that we go on. I don't want you living here just for free. And he's like, this will be your way of paying me back. The first couple of times was really hard for me, but after a while, it was just, this is a thing that we did, you know, when you don't have anywhere else to go. I didn't have anywhere else to go. Jaden tells her whole story on YouTube's Exodus Road TV. It's definitely too rough to play here. But I will tell you that before she was 20 years old, she was held at gunpoint, she was raped, she watched someone overdose, and she witnessed way too many sex acts committed by her underage friends. And her story, well, it's relatively light compared to what happens to most children. Because remember, that life expectancy of seven years, it's real. The amount of stress, drug addiction, violence, and malnutrition that these kids are forced into is just downright frightening. The dude's sitting on the bed, and he's looking at me the entire time. And I'm like, what are you looking at? And he's like, I want her. And I'm like, I'm not doing this. And he's really angry, and he's like, so you're telling me you're not going to give me what I want? He goes into his pocket and he pulls out a gun. I'm sitting there crying on the floor. He tells me that I'm going to do, do this thing to him. And I'm like, mm, I guess I am. I'm like, I'm about to. And he looks at me and he says, I hope you really didn't expect to live here and not do anything for us. I'm still crying because this man was holding a gun to my head not too long ago. And in my head, I'm going through all these different scenarios of how my life could play out. I'm playing back all these girls of what they said, you know, you're not going to be able to do this sober. So I'm going to be a drug addict just like my mother. So how do sex traffickers get to your kids online? And are there some not-so-obvious ways that traffickers approach kids? Well, let's meet Jessica Boss. She's an award-winning actress, producer, and sex trafficking activist. And we're talking about how sex traffickers can get to your kids online. And also, some not-so-obvious ways that traffickers approach the kids. She and her husband, Mike, have more than 20 film credits. And they're currently working on a documentary series with producer Warren Dorso about the perils of human trafficking. Hey, Jessica, welcome. I, I know this is a tough topic for so many people to hear about, but it's really important. Oh, well, thank you, Kim, for having me. I appreciate it. First of all, Jessica, let's start at the beginning. What makes you so passionate about warning girls about traffickers and parents and grandparents. What's your personal story? How did you get involved in this anyway? It all started when I was actually approaching an agent to rep me as an actor. And he actually said no because I had no credit, like legitimate credit, primetime TV. And so he actually offered to help me get those first few credits. And I took him up on the offer. Now, I didn't know that that would actually send me into my purpose because when he told me to market myself as a Nigerian actress and to go learn a language, I went to YouTube and started learning pidgin and, you know, trying to learn as much as I could about the language. And that's when I stumbled upon a woman, a Nigerian woman, talking about her experience being sex trafficked and recalling horrific details like being beaten and raped by her captors and servicing up to 20, 30, 40 men a day. And it broke my heart to the point where I just, I knew I had to do something, but at the time I didn't know what I had to do because I just kept thinking, well, all I do is act, so I don't really know how that's going to help. But the more I just pressed into God and asked him, what should I do with this? I heard very clearly, write the screenplay, 
and then produce the screenplay. And your screenplay is about that very same Nigerian woman. It's called Ijeoma's Story. None of us want our daughters ending up like Ijeoma. So, Jessica, if you wouldn't mind, just go down the line and tell us, well, how do you really spot a sex trafficker? One of the biggest ways to spot a trafficker is if there's a stranger who is coming up to you and saying that they can promise you, you know, the best. They can give you this. They can give you that. I can do so much for your career. And they want you to move from where you are in public, maybe, to their private residence so that they can have you show them what you can do. That's probably like one of the biggest red flags. So offering to buy you gifts, saying that they can help you, asking you to do something for them in a private location. I got it. It makes sense. But what about online? Can a fake Instagram or Facebook profile or Snap profile or something like that actually do it? That's a very good question, Kim. I would say that kids, I mean, unfortunately, they ought to be aware of these things, that the people who are on the other end, because they're just an avatar, they're not really who they say they are. So if they're communicating with somebody on their, you know, I know that there's a game where it's very interactive and they have names. If they are suggesting a meetup or any sort of need to meet up with them, don't meet up with the people unless you know who they are. They go to your school, especially with cyber, internet, and IM, chat rooms. It's really challenging because you, you just, as a, as a kid, you're innocent. You, you think that people say what they mean, and that's not always the case. No, and kids get so easily snared by someone who offers to buy them stuff. Maybe like designer clothes, the latest Kardashian makeup set, gaming gear, or a smartphone. Stuff that maybe mom and dad won't buy them or can't afford to buy them. I mean, who doesn't want free stuff, right? I would say that, especially when it comes to an adult saying that they're going to give a kid something, and, it, and especially if it's an adult that you don't know, oftentimes that's another red flag. And they'll actually do it. They'll buy young girls nail extensions, clothing, like top-notch handbags that are Gucci and name brands. They lure them with stuff. Well, we do live in a material culture, and social media is doing nothing but promoting that. So I can't say that I'm really surprised. One thing people don't also know is that some of the kids are, are being trafficked, and they're going to school every day, and they're not enslaved the way we think. So if you notice, your friend is all of a sudden wearing the most expensive shoes and uh, name brand handbags and having her hair done up and nails and her mood is changing. Like she's becoming a little bit more withdrawn. That's a good sign for you to keep an eye for your friend because oftentimes that is um, a sign of trafficking happening. Yeah, I saw the mugshot page on the Trust AZ website. You wouldn't believe how many teachers are also involved in trafficking kids. Oh, my gosh. You just never know. It's really awful because we have a very vague idea of what trafficking looks like. And trafficking can take on many forms. Traffickers know how to manipulate their victims. They're men who you would look at and not think, oh, they're scary, ugly guys that I need to avoid. Oh, I need to turn away from them. They're charming. They're good looking. They're well versed. They're people who are everyday people, even people you would never suspect. And that's the danger. They could even be friends of the family, family members. So then it becomes very tricky because you can be trafficked from, you know, uncles, mothers, fathers. There's so many cases of that. So it's always good to keep an eye out for those sort of things because it really doesn't exist the way people think. Yeah, the same thing goes for online profiles. I like what you had to say about fake Facebook names, Kim, because I think that's one thing that children don't understand. Sometimes the people have fake Facebook names, and it's so easy to do, to set up a completely false Facebook profile. And that's one of the ways they're able to maintain their own identity so that they don't get tracked down. Jessica, I'm sure there are specific websites that cater to pedophiles. I mean, we don't want to mention any X-rated websites on this podcast, of course, but is there a site where parents can look for their missing kids? Backpage.com. Backpage, is, it's like a Craigslist where there's many different resources and, you know, you can sell and buy things. Now, the issue was with Backpage, they were using in their adult section, they're trafficking young women and putting them up on their adult section. So what we don't see is that people 
people might think, oh, adult section, these are just women who are volunteering their own, you know, services. But they're actually children who have been tricked to be placed on these sites as adult servicers. People had brought it to their attention, and they did nothing about it, so they were abetting in this whole thing. We need to be able to hold these people accountable because they're trafficking girls and putting them on this site and pretending to be someone they're not. So when they're chatting on IM and then they think they're talking to someone their age, they're actually talking to someone who does not look like them, who might be in their 50s. So it's, it's really something that I'm passionate about to, to keep educating people about trafficking and the different signs about trafficking and what to watch out for so that we can prevent people from becoming victims. Hey, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. You passed along so much valuable information. And I'll tell you, I, for one, to be looking for your new film. Please, please keep up the great work. You're helping a whole bunch of people. Thank you so much, Kim, for having me. Literally, it was a pleasure to chat with you, too. You can find Jessica on YouTube, where she posts weekly videos about trafficking prevention. She has tips to spot a trafficker and motivational videos. And you can subscribe on bit.ly slash Jessica Boss. Up next, former neo-Nazi skinhead leader Christian Picciolini explains how vulnerable kids are recruited into hate and terrorist groups. But first, let's check in with a couple of our sponsors who help make Commando on Demand possible. Christian Picciolini was just 14 years old when he met a guy who he thought, hey, could be his best friend. Well, it turns out the guy was a recruiter for one of the very first violent white power skinhead groups. But most of the boys who end up joining these groups don't join for political reasons. They actually join for something else. From my experience, ideology is not what's driving radicalization. It's an individual search for identity, community, and purpose. Those are three basic uh, foundational human needs that I think that everybody in their lives looks for. Who am I? Where do I belong? And what am I supposed to do with my life? And I think kids can find a sense of purpose sometimes when they play video games. With a little hard work and effort, they can be heroes in the virtual world, especially when in the real world, nobody pays attention to them at all. As a 14-year-old kid of immigrant parents, Christian knew that kind of loneliness. When I was recruited, I was just that morning running to the corner store with change to buy baseball cards and lemon heads. I was 14 years old. I had no idea about politics. I didn't understand racism, although I'm sure I was complicit in, you know, institutional, you know, privilege and everything, but I didn't learn it from my parents. My parents are Italian immigrants who came to the United States in the mid-60s. So for all intent and purpose, I should not have gone down that route. What happened to me, one of my potholes, or my main pothole, was abandonment. My parents, because they were immigrants, had to work seven days a week, 15 hours a day. I never saw them. And while they were providing and they were, you know, they loved me and, you know, I had aunts and grandparents around me, I never knew how to be vulnerable enough to to express my feelings. I always thought, you know, what did I do to push them away? So, you know, you start to act out uh, at a young age to, to try and get their attention. I mean, who doesn't want to belong? Every single person on earth wants to be loved or accepted or respected. It's pretty easy to identify the people that don't belong. It's pretty easy to promise them things that make them feel better about themselves. Some kids won't fall for it, but a lot of kids will, and they do. It comes down to how many potholes a young kid runs into in life. If we hit what I call potholes in our life's journey, it could be trauma, it could be poverty, it could be privilege, it could be uh, mental illness, it could be anything really. If we don't have enough resources to navigate those potholes or enough resilience to be able to navigate them, they detour us. And that can happen to anybody. It can happen to somebody who's been abused their whole life, or it can happen to somebody like a Richard Spencer who has extreme privilege uh, and an education and is bright. Uh, So, you know, in my opinion, what I've seen is those potholes, that trauma that we experience, whether it's, you know, a lot of little ones or one really big one, uh, tends to deviate our search for identity, community, and purpose. And when we get detoured, there are people waiting for us who understand those vulnerabilities in us. Uh, And they're very savvy at at kind of tailoring their pitch or their approach, uh, as I was at one point in my life, to understand for every person what their potholes were so that I could promise them paradise. And not only did he promise new recruits this so-called paradise, which can be something different for every child, 
But then he took their desires and pointed them directly towards hate and destruction. Essentially create some imaginary enemy that would put their focus on them so that they can project their own self-hatred onto them. Because really, I, I do believe that hatred in itself is, is really self-hatred being projected. Whatever avenue hate groups use to get in, whether it's video games or chat rooms or Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or even at school, the cause is the same and the end result is the same, which puts the ball squarely back in whoever is in charge of this child, whether it's the parents or the grandparents. I don't think that adults know how to be vulnerable with young people and in turn they will never be vulnerable with us. If we can't talk to our children or our students or our players about what is really going on with us, they'll never learn how to do that with us. They think we're superheroes. You know, kids growing up think my parents, you know, weren't around and I still, you know, like I wanted them to be because I looked up to them. Christian went on to lead a white power punk band. He wrote songs that would inspire others to commit racist acts of violence. But after eight years as a neo-Nazi, something deep inside Christian changed. While he was beating up a young black man, he looked into his victim's eyes and he felt something he never experienced before. That was empathy. Coming up, you just have to know about these popular apps that the kids are downloading. Many of them have a dark side that can lead predators directly right to your kids. We're going to blow their cover. Plus, there's a criminal world that most of us would never imagine. There are traffickers around us every single day. The average age of a child who is first exploited and trafficked is just 12 years old. Kids being targeted during school with their phones through apps like Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. He like messaged me on there and he, he gave me his number. It happens most more than you would think. Just weird to think that my friends could be talking to someone that they don't even know that are like faking their identity. All right, welcome back. We're into the home stretch of this podcast. You don't want to miss this. This is where the real knowledge happens. It's the payoff for listening all the way through. Stacy Sutherland is the director of programs for TrustAZ.org. Hey, Stacy, thank you so much for being with us today. Hello, Kim. Thank you so much for having me. I've been to your website, of course. But just real quick, what does your organization actually do? So Trust Arizona stands for Training and Resources United to Stop Trafficking. Um, and we are a program that is a part of the Arizona Anti-Trafficking Network. And our main job duty is to provide free training and free resources about human trafficking to anybody that wants training. So we train everybody from the general public, moms groups, church groups, anybody in the general public, all the way up to law enforcement and prosecutors. Kids spend a lot of time online, which can make them despondent to begin with. But what are some other signs that a child might be communicating with a potential trafficker or an abductor? So commonly, a trafficker is going to be utilizing an online platform to groom their victim. They look for victims who are unsuspecting or vulnerable. I want to be careful when we use terms like abductor or abduction because rarely are trafficking victims abducted. It is a grooming process. You know, that's really good to know. I appreciate you pointing that out for us. Yeah, absolutely. Parents should look for a child that spends too much time on a PC, a mobile device. I kind of laugh at this. I have three boys. So, you know, what's excess for your child? Are they receiving phone calls, emails, texts from strangers or someone new to you whom you're very unfamiliar with or somebody just new out of the blue? You may even find sexually explicit photos or videos on your kid's PC, laptop, or mobile devices if your child um, maybe is communicating with them. Someone might be sending some images or requesting images. So you might see some things like that. If your child has turning off their screens, deleting their histories, um, especially when you walk in the room, they switch screens or tabs really quickly or they're closing things down. And then we want to look for kids who seem to be more withdrawn than normal. So I have seen Sometimes they're a little bit grumpy, but we're actually looking for the kids that are actually withdrawing from their parents, withdrawing from social activities, their friends, and things in that manner. Okay, now we've already talked about luring girls and boys with gifts and blank, love and opportunity. But what are some websites traffickers are using to recruit? Traffickers are going to be found wherever our children and teens are found. So we can see recruitment through all of the common social media sites. 
Facebook tends to be one of the lesser ones, but yet there's still some recruitment there. Um, most teenagers think that Facebook is for old people or adults, so we don't see a lot of teens there. Or they have a Facebook account to appease their parents and then have a different kind of social media account. Um, any of the social media apps, as well as anything that has an app with the chat function, um, where a predator can reach out to an unsuspecting kid. I mean, the grooming process can start as simply just starting with a message like, hey, what's up? And just starting a chat that way. Like Musical.ly, for example. Musical.ly has a backdoor chat program. Most parents think that their child is on just singing with this app, and then it actually has a backdoor chat. So I know a couple years ago that was on a radar because a lot of parents didn't know that it had a backdoor chat application in it. Okay, wait a minute. A lot of kids are using Musical.ly. I mean, you never would really suspect that when they're singing popular songs that it has a dark side. Crazy stuff. Are there other apps that we should really know about and be aware of? I know, like, Kick, Instagram, Snapchat, some of those, we have seen some trafficking and some recruitment on some of those apps as well, uh, because they have the private messaging attached to those as well as other chats. I spoke with some linguistics experts, and they say that child abductors, well, they often take on multiple online personalities. The goal of the trafficker or even an online predator, is to try to lure that kid into what they want them to do or to figure out, like, you know, they're looking for those vulnerabilities to manipulate them. So maybe they're a guy, but they need to come across as a girl. And we see that a lot also, too, when adults are looking to to lure a minor into a sexual relationship or sexual exploitation as well. And that process is used heavily to hide under different personas to get what they want from the victim. So maybe going as a male is not working, but if they're like, oh, hey, I'm a young girl just like you, you know, then they can maybe get in the door from there and then say, oh, let me introduce you to my friend. He's really great. Um, It can't be used, the different personas, as a luring tool, absolutely. I was looking through the Trust AZ mugshot section, and I really was so shocked to see how many of these men and women, well, they were actually in a profession that we trust. I'm talking about teachers, even in person. It's so hard to tell when someone is in the trafficking business. Uh, that is a scary thing. So the most traffickers and predators do look like you and I do. You could be in the grocery store and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a trafficker and a person, but the same goes for our victims. Our victims look just like you and I do. So you could be in the grocery store with a potential victim or the mall with a potential victim and never know that they are a victim. So what if we have a hunch? What if we think that something's up with an adult or a child? How can we get help? If our listeners suspect that there's something going on with a child and adult and they feel like it's trafficking, um, I always advise all law enforcement immediately. If they're concerned that it's a trafficking situation or they're not sure, I advise people to call the National Human Trafficking Hotline, and that number is 1-888-3737-888. And I like the hotline because you can go to the hotline and say, hey, I think this might be human trafficking, and they'll go through indicators that you're seeing, and they'll tell you if it's a low, medium, or high risk for trafficking, or if you do suspect trafficking and it meets indicators and you have a license plate or something or just want to report a tip to something in your neighborhood, maybe you think there's like a residential brothel in your neighborhood, you can give them anonymous tips and they can forward that on to law enforcement. I really like the use of that hotline. Did you get that? You want to contact the National Human Trafficking Hotline. The number is, I'll give it to you, but if you need it, just know that you can always Google search it. It's one 373 7888 Now, What about if you just have a hunch about a neighbor, say that something might be going on, that maybe he's molesting girls or whatever? The standard is to have reasonable belief because, of course, child pornography, um, trafficking, all that is child abuse. If you have a reasonable belief that somebody might be viewing pornography or child pornography or distributing it or potentially uh, hurting victims, I always encourage people to call their local law enforcement. And sometimes people aren't comfortable calling local law enforcement because they're just scared that it might be unfounded and the person might find out they reported or things like that. You can also call the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, uh, also known as NICMIC. They have a cyber tip line, and you can call 1-800-THE-LAW to report child pornography or child exploitation there. Or you can also call the Homeland Security tip line, and that number is one 866 dhs 2 ice I-C-E. You can report child pornography that way. Okay, here's what we're going to do. 
It's really hard to remember phone numbers listening to a podcast. So we'll put an article up on commando.com that lists all the important details here. There are also ways that you can protect your kids. I'm talking about child monitoring, child logging. Just because a school is giving your child a laptop or a Chromebook or an iPad or whatever it is for them to do their studies, do not think for a moment or assume that that gadget, that laptop, whatever it is, has parental controls built in. And if they do have parental controls, let me tell you something else. The kids know ways around them. They just do. They share their secrets with one another. You have to take responsibility for securing all your gadgets. Now, I hope this podcast wasn't too much of a downer for you. I mean, it's not exactly everyone's favorite topic. But with 40 kids going missing every single second in the United States alone, and with most of the communication happening online, I felt it was really important for us to cover this in Commando On Demand. Knowledge is power, and now you're aware. And if you have any parents or grandparents in your circle of family members and friends, this is a really good podcast for you to share with them. We have ways for you to share it over at podnet.com. Just hit the podcast, find the episode, and then there's a triangle with three circles. I know, you're like, what the heck does that icon mean? Well, that's the way that you share any podcast over at podnet.com. That's our official podcast network over at commando.com, which, by the way, if you happen to host your own podcast and you'd like to be part of Podnet, just reach out to us. There's all kinds of ways you can do that. I'd like to thank our awesome guests, Stacey Sutherland of TrustAZ.org and activist actress Jessica Boss. I also want to thank our contributing experts, Christian Picciolini, Exodus Road TV, Alyssa Iveson, The Gaines Family, WESH2 News, NBC, and WANE TV. Plus, Jaden and Alyssa, who shared their very personal stories with us. I hope what you learned on this podcast gives you confidence in protecting your family, and you don't have to worry about the unknown. Thanks for listening, and thanks for being part of our family. 